Competition, coalition, domination. These are the weapons of the political animal. Such is the human race, wrote Mark Twain. Often it does seem such a pity that Noah didn't miss the boat. If politics is the art of the possible, what does it really take to reach the top in the animal kingdom? Animals, like humans, have learned to live together for millions of years. Our political odyssey around the globe will meet the warring tribes, cruel despots and democrats that make up the animal world. Well before humans developed the political skills of a Hitler, Gandhi or Kennedy, animals evolved an array of strategies to make their communities work and impose their will on others. So is man that much cleverer or cunning than a monkey, bird or insect? And can we find in their world a perfect political system? Power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. This was the British historian Lord Acton's epic warning in the second half of the 19th century, so vividly conveyed by Charlie Chaplin in his numerous political satires. Since time immemorial, political tyranny has led to war and slavery. In the animal world, slavery is a most effective political weapon. Well, it's pretty quiet right here in this dry forest, but about two hours from now, this is going to be the site of a battle royal. Slavery remains a hidden scourge in some parts of the world, even though formal human emancipation occurred well over a century ago. It didn't extend to the insect world. Howard Topoff of the Museum of Natural History in Arizona has been a keen observer of slave-making ants for 20 years. This is a staging area for warfare between two groups of ants. The ants in this nest are gonna attack a species 100 yards away, steal their young, bring them home, and turn them into slaves. Nations, empires, were built on the backs of slaves. For polyergous ants, slavery is a matter of survival. They neither forage for food, look after their young or queens, nor clean their nests. Their method is chillingly simple, enslave other species to do the work for them. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle justified slavery as long as the interests of master and slave were the same. Is this what he had in mind? Two prototypes seemingly made for each other. A polyurgus raid is on. Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. Even Shakespeare could not have imagined the next act. The polyurgus ants use chemical weapons to overpower their enemies, in this case, formica ants. The defenders panic. Some try in vain to rescue their queen, others to protect the cocoons but it's already too late. A polyurgus queen, ready to lay eggs, joins the attack. Her goal, to seize power unconditionally in the enemy nest. And here's the cruelest part. 
The Polyurgis are not just out to enslave their enemy, but equally their enemy's offspring, dragging four mica cocoons back to their nest. Ants born into slavery. So when a polyurgis queen gets into a formica nest, first thing she has to do is find that formica queen and kill her. But interestingly, when we have observations in the laboratory on this killing process, we found that not only is the polyurgis queen killing the formica queen, but she's licking her all over, her head, her thorax, her abdomen. She licks her for maybe 20 minutes. And only after this licking process do the workers of Formica adopt the polyurgis queen as their own. So we thought that perhaps what's happening in this here is that the polyurgis queen is getting the chemicals, the pheromones from the Formica queen. Laboratory tests confirm Howard Topoff's hunch. He and his team drew up chemical profiles of both queens, polyurgis and Formica. Before the raid, they looked quite different, each with their own distinct chemical identity. But after killing the Formica Queen, the Polyurgis begins to change. Her chemical ID becomes a dead ringer of the assassinated Formica Queen, a perfect disguise to dupe the unsuspecting Formica workers in their very own nest. This could be a blessing in disguise for the Formica ants. Ignorance is surely bliss when a foreign queen tricks you into slavery. The slave's first job is to tend to their new queen's eggs. The eggs will hatch into their future taskmasters. When they're fully grown, they'll raid more Formica nests to keep slave numbers healthily high. Slavery has far from disappeared beneath the earth. Slavery and fascism are the ugly faces of ancient and modern politics. But instead of one powerful dictator, some societies buckle under coalitions of hard, like-minded troopers. The kingdom of the Hamadrius begins in the deserts of the Arabian Peninsula. Here, these male desert baboons are true troopers to the cause, with each adult male retaining exclusive rights over a harem of females, only negotiation can keep the peace in this macho society. Power rests in the hands of the few in Hamadria society, and exclusively in the hands of the male. Like in many human societies, these desert baboons on the Arabian Peninsula believe a woman's place is in the home. In ancient Greece, Aristotle opined, women are without authority, less capable than men of leadership, so they should be excluded from the affairs of state. Here, a single male leader dominates a group of females, exercising exclusive rights over his harem. Females endure constant surveillance. Their movements are severely restricted. If a female strays too far, the male leader intervenes promptly. Anything goes to remind the fairer and weaker sex of her place. Intimidation and brute force are meted out without ceremony. A bite on the neck. A tug of the tail. All's fair in love and war. When a female is on heat, the noose tightens even further. This female is kept on a very short leash. Her only option is to court favour with the male and submit to the unwavering laws of the harem. Social hierarchy dictates the female with the highest status stays closest to her master. 
If she's unhappy with her lot, she runs the risk of being stolen by another male. When a female does fly the coop, she's fair game for frustrated suitors. The stakes are high. Everyone is watching. Claiming a loose female and forming your own harem can only enhance male social status. And status is always up for grabs, no matter how brutish the behaviour. But as the ancient Chinese philosopher Confucius cautioned, when anger arises, think of the consequences. Even in this macho environment, patience is a virtue. A passive bystander can seize his chance while the others fight it out. On the face of it, baboons seem to have a one-track mind, building and preserving their harems with brawn, not brain. Scientific surveys now cast Hamadria's society in a more generous light. A young, single baboon can integrate peacefully into a harem, biding his time patiently before forming his own and acquiring the status of leader. A successful young pretender builds up trust with the dominant male and his females before acceding to the ultimate prize. Sexual impulse is a double-edged sword. It foments conflict, but also instills harmony. Despite their fierce canine teeth and muscular build, desert baboons use a network of male alliances to keep the peace. Clans of two or more harems band together. These bands, in turn, form troops. Cooperation and negotiation are the building blocks of the Hamadrius political order. And well before Machiavelli told the Prince of Italy how to keep political power, baboons were well versed in one of his cardinal principles, never plunder another's property or take his woman by force. In spite of stiff competition, the rule is generally respected. Troops march to the same tune. Discrete signals ensure rules are crystal clear. A reassuring pat on the back. Everyone knows where they stand. Peace abroad means peace inside the harem. Their harems may function in much the same way as polite human society, where the occasional burst of aggressive behaviour between males is tempered by respect for the property of others, in this case, female desert baboons. World away from the repressive desert harems are the permissive playgrounds of the African jungle. The veil has no place in this society. Female bonobo chimps in the Democratic Republic of Congo offer themselves up as sexual favours to any interested male. Bonobos of all ages enjoy free love. This must be male paradise. There's no catch. Wait a minute, she wants a snack. And so does she. It's all part of a deal. This is the deal. 
Unlike the possessive baboons of the Arabian Peninsula, male bonobos do not covet females as sexual trophies to be guarded at all times. Sex is traded freely for food and to avert conflict. It's a political language that fosters social harmony in heterosexual, homosexual and incestuous combinations. Like humans, they even do it facing each other. Bonobos make love, not war, in an egalitarian, free society, much like the hippie movement of the 1960s. Sex is not just about reproduction. It's about appeasement, harmony and free trade. Fancy emigrating? Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! Winston Churchill once joked, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. But is democracy purely man-made, or does it resonate elsewhere in the natural world? Known as the Forbidden Island because it was once privately owned by a wealthy English family, the island of Rum off the west coast of Scotland is an unlikely setting for popular politics. Local people were cleared long ago to make way for sheep and deer. And it's the 350 red deer, all coloured and marked for scientific observation, that beat the democratic drum. Every day they descend the mountain to graze in the valley, then settle to digest and rest. Shy, retiring animals, these deer hardly seem ready to vote with their feet, so what moves them? Not much to the frustration of the cameras. Is it motherly love? And who rules them? A single leader? Obviously not him. The cameras keep rolling, patiently. Very patiently. At last, a second deer stands to be counted, then a third and a fourth. We seem to have a majority, but in favour of what? One by one, the deer stand, stretch and nibble without the slightest indication that anything else is afoot. Or is it? After 15 minutes, they do seem unanimously agreed on something. simply to move on, together. That's democracy on the Isle of Rum. The deer seem happy to quietly chew the cud, but their outwardly submissive nature belies a strong democratic streak. Power politics have no place on this remote Scottish island. Now he pauses before a woman with a child. Damn it. Power politics work best when the Even public the is easily friends, swayed. All smiles at his excellency's attention. Easily manipulated. The successful power politician must be as cunning as a rat. This is the dark side of politics. It's an underworld of stealth, deceit and fear. Where politicians keep their cards close to their chest, hugging the margins of public life. To avoid transparency. Nocturnal animals do the same. Rats are opportunists of the first order. Feared and detested for spreading disease, their intelligence and pervasiveness also make us uneasy. Where there are people, there are rats. They're always one step ahead of the game. At the slightest threat, rats emit ultrasonic signals to warn their own. 
the Three Musketeers are off. If you can't stand the catwalk, try the sewers. In the event, this time-honoured lifeline proves a mixed blessing for the Musketeers. They feel like, well, cornered rats, because this is foreign territory, and with old whiskers on their tail, who knows what else lies ahead. Thank God, they're one of us. But beware friends not equal to yourself. Confucius is back with a timely reminder. This colony of sewer rats could offer the musketeers a bed for the night, but would that be a popular move? The dominant male must make a decision. Resources are scarce. The intruders might stay. The people clamour for protection. Negotiations are out of the question. But a combination of gentle persuasion and intimidation will go a long way. The people expect. One by one, the musketeers swallow their pride. Out they go to face another day. Old spoil sports is tickled pink. Mission accomplished. The dominant male reinforced his position in the colony by seeing off an external threat. An unexpected flood puts the rats under renewed pressure and at the drop of a hat, or a carton of chips, a social structure emerges. The presence of food will test the rat's political mettle. When the chips are down and the stakes so high, manipulation, cunning and courage are called for. He who hesitates is lost. This takes courage because political necessities sometimes turn out to be political mistakes. Is it not more cunning to wait and reap the fruits of someone else's labour? After all, domination is an art which Karl Marx called the peaceful enjoyment of the blood and sweat of others. But never be discouraged by the weakness of others, nor the difficulty of the task at hand. Courage and tenacity, peppered with selfishness, are the ingredients of success. A measly carton of chips brings out the best and worst in a small colony of sewer rats. Three dominant personality traits would seem to emerge. The exploiter, the exploited and the enterprising. Ring a bell? Our own politicians would blush at any comparison. The successful politician must unite his party to maintain power. There's strength in numbers. No place on our planet better underlines this lesson than the ocean depths. A family of jacks patrols the barrier reefs of the Atlantic. Most of the time, they live in sparse schools. 
But at the first sign of trouble, the Jacks regroup. They must now move as one for their own protection. Any stragglers are dead in the water. But how do they do this? Jacks have a sixth sense. Special cells on their sides detect the vibrations of their neighbours. When one jack on the exposed outer flank swerves suddenly, the others synchronise instantly. The sharks struggle to press home the attack. But the jacks can't hold out forever. The phalanx tightens, not for defence, but for attack. Predator turns protector in this ingenious strategy to use the enemy as a shield. The lesson is clear. Rally and move as one to advance the common good. But where in nature do animals abuse the common good? We're about to find out. A politician builds his integrity on image and reputation. He must act the part. Machiavelli told the Prince of Italy he did not have to be good, merely appear to be. Please, please, gentlemen, no more pictures. Birds of a particular feather in Australia appear to live happily together. The chuff is a cooperative bird. It inhabits Australia's rich eucalyptus forests. During the reproductive season, they band together to build nests, incubate and eventually feed and protect the chicks. Parental responsibility extends to the whole community. Every member plays a part. Even young chuffs must help keep the ration line moving in return for the protection of the group. This collective effort means birds can cover a wide area to find food in the knowledge that the nests are not left unattended. In fact, everyone is minding everyone else's back. Adults and young helpers take turns finding food on the forest floor and return to surrender the pickings. How selfless can you get? But there's a quid pro quo, a little give and take, you might say. This is where Machiavelli picks up the story again. For some, child minding in return for group protection is not enough. After all, it's not exactly the sort of work you volunteer for. To all appearances, this is just another feeding session. One helper feeds, the other waits his turn or rests. Reassured the nest is in good hands, the first helper flies off to find more food. It's all about trust. Back at the nest, the second helper is alone and can do as he pleases. He seems to tease the chicks like an adolescent might an infant. But this is no game. It's a profitable political strategy. Down the hatch, his own hatch. Not to put too fine a point on it, he's pretty chuffed, because nobody will tell, will they? And you wouldn't know his integrity as an active member of the group belies all the cunning and duplicity of Machiavelli himself, putting the individual ahead of the common good. Animal politics matures into a remarkably sophisticated art at the Arnhem Zoo in the Netherlands. Here, primatologist Frans de Waal peers through the window into the political life of chimpanzees.
the males among themselves have an enormous complex political life. And I've written about it. I've written a book, Chimpanzee Politics, which is about all the coalitions they form and the divide and rule strategies that they have. And so males work this out all among themselves in the chimpanzee society. For the first time ever, captive chimpanzees live together in conditions as close as possible to those found in the wild. So for Arnhem Zoo, read Reality TV. The idea is to study the chimps' social behaviour close up and occasionally throw a spanner in the works. <laughs> A single dominant male rules in chimp communities. Other males compete for influence and challenge the leadership. Jambo has just ousted Jing as group leader. Body language confirms the situation is now stable. The group, for the time being, looks to Jambo to assure its safety while Jing broods alone on his fate. The onus now falls on Jambo to strengthen his authority by inspiring confidence rather than fear. He must be a father figure, not a tyrant. The leader's stature depends on healthy social bonds. As long as he guarantees their security, they will guarantee his. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Like humans, evolution blessed chimpanzees with logical thought. They can consider the future and calculate the odds. All good political tools. Watch a simple experiment and see how the chimp masters political trickery. Jambo may have restored harmony, but the group is only the sum of its parts. Individuals, like this female, have their own interests at heart. She knows where an orange has been hidden. If she's not careful, she'll be forced to share. In the words of the 19th century French statesman, Prince de Talleyrand, a court is merely an assembly of noble and distinguished beggars. The trick is to wait for the right moment. Time to act. Patience and careful planning are rewarded. But there were two oranges. Another chimp is wise to it. He too considers all the angles, calculating the odds and assessing the stage before acting. Individuals put on their best behaviour at the leader's table. Jambo feels compelled to flaunt his share because food is a perennial source of conflict and frustration. He wants to set a good example. A good leader is a servant to his people, and Jambo understands the importance of sharing. This can only enhance Jambo's stature in the group and build up credit for his future as leader. But old scores remain to be settled. The former dominant male, Jing, returns to square up with Jambo, and onlookers better make themselves scarce. 
Jambo must find a way to save face in front of the group and deal with Jing once and for all. At this point, the role of females in restoring peace to the group emerges. A female leads Jing towards Jambo. Jambo acknowledges the female, showing he's boss. He ends up paying her homage in the best way he knows. Sexual foreplay, not on your life. Political foreplay. The female has served as pretext for Jing to sneak up on Jambo without making uncomfortable eye contact. Calculating female mediation works wonders. Jambo, like every good leader, sets an example by smoothing over any remaining differences. Everyone hopes this is the last chapter in this very male feud. If female chimpanzees are skilled in managing conflict, often they become the butt of it. Jambo's desire is her command. Other males either put up or shut up. <laughs> the leader enjoys a complete monopoly on any female in heat. Jambo's dalliances carry great political weight. His genes must come first. So how do you get a look in if you're not the boss? Any overt attempt at reproduction in front of the dominant male is asking for trouble. It was a brave effort, but none too subtle. For Zuli, secret rendezvous are the only answer. He assumes that what Jambo doesn't see, he won't know. But Jambo has cultivated allies, spies. Zuli has sown the seeds of more trouble. Joeri sets out to betray Zuli. Jambo acts quickly. He must. An ill wind blows through the community. Zuli comes out of hiding and raises the stakes. He imposes himself on the group, pressing home the treachery in the hope of winning allies to confront Jambo. But Zuli's bravado fails to impress. It's a major miscalculation. And he knows it. Collective indifference to Zuli only adds salt to his wounds. He vents his frustration on the females, easy targets for him to show off his strength. The eldest female, Mama, bears the brunt of Zuli's rage. That only brings our young, impulsive chimp further into disrepute. Mama moves to Jambo's side, a poignantly symbolic gesture. In the end, Zuli's capitulation is so complete, Jambo's inaction speaks volumes. The last thing Jambo wants now is to reignite the conflict. Their stability is paramount.
the moment of truth. Jambo hardly bats an eyebrow. If Zuli wants back in, that's up to him. Zuli's tough political rites of passage is complete. It's one which he won't easily forget. For Jambo, magnanimity and victory will keep them on his side for now at least. A week is a long time in politics. So what has Zuli learned? Where did he go so wrong? He failed to build allies, cultivate political bonds before making a bid for power. If Zuli learns these lessons, his day will surely come. As Margaret Thatcher is often quoted as saying, you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. Zuli should know. In an ideal world, politics isn't just about grabbing power. It's, as Aristotle said, a noble practice to keep citizens happy in the polis, or city-state. The key to running this state? Organisation. But is this the noble life Aristotle had in mind? Greek democracy considered all citizens equal. That's after excluding women, foreigners and, of course, slaves. The Jura forests of Switzerland are home to one of the most organised and egalitarian societies on the planet. Where else would you find the complete submission of the individual to the good of the state than inside an anthill? Welcome back to the world of Formica ants. But here, they're no longer slaves of the Polyurgis ant. In these forests, they live among themselves in peace. And over many miles in an intricate network of colonies that eclipse, in organisational terms, almost any other animal community on Earth. This is Arno Maida, a biologist from the University of Lausanne. And he's itching to guide us through this underworld. Prepare to enter the super colony. For insects used to the cramped, claustrophobic confines of a nest, for mica ants, also known as wood ants, spread themselves surprisingly thin on the ground. A hundred kilometres of pathways link one colony to another in this remote Swiss forest. Arno Maida needs satellite technology to keep up. His GPS tracking system records where one nest lies in relation to another. It maps the supercolony of one of the world's most organised and peaceful societies. It's taken years and a lot of trekking for biologists to see the big picture. So just what kind of a community does the wood ant inhabit? Like Switzerland, the supercolony is a federal state, 1,200 nests scattered within the superstructure of the federation. Typically for these fussy insects, one nest differs from another, both in size and function. For obvious reasons, there are mother nests, then temporary seasonal nests for gathering provisions, and secondary nests, which run individual sectors. How many sectors? 60. How many nests to each sector? 25. Wood ants leave nothing to chance. They circulate, communicate and trade over a vast area. Compared to the warring slave-making ants, this is utopia, and it's evolved over a long time. Ants have blanketed the Earth for over 100 million years, their combined weight makes up 15% of our planet's biomass. But to understand this Swiss supercolony, scientists threw the textbook out of the window. 
Dans cette société, In this society, there are 150 million ants, which is phenomenal. But even more amazing is that there are hundreds of thousands of queens who coexist in perfect harmony. There are no wars in the system, which we can compare to a sort of federation without a leader, completely self-organized and based on a politic of mutual help. And it never becomes anarchic. No leader? Aristotle would turn in his grave. If we look carefully, what we're seeing is an apolitical society of ants, obsessively self-regulated, just like a machine. But who are we to put down the super ant when they're clearly so highly organised? Along highways and byways, they communicate incessantly. Touching and exchanging odours warn of sector needs or intrusions ahead. The information pipeline binds the super ants of the super colony together. Never tell a passing worker to mind his own business. He's a control freak and a workaholic. Attention all workers, food to sector 12, food to sector 12. In this feverish environment, a worker must literally pull far more than his own weight. Feeding tens of thousands of mouths in a single nest is a task of biblical proportions. Unusually, these wood ants adapt to any task at hand, hunting, foraging, building, anything to avoid lounging around. Plenty of workers die on the job. Others immediately replace them from a pool of reserves. The super colony is a one-party state that caters for present and future needs. If one sector falls short of workers, hard to believe, new blood must be found. There's no shortage of queens to lay eggs where they're most needed. This budding phenomena, queens pressed into service in a new nest, cuts right across the grain of most animal societies. Arno Maeder and his fellow biologists are asking themselves a lot of hard questions. In this society, there's a real scientific paradox which is related to the theory of parental selection. This theory means that individuals will help each other if they are related. But in an anthill, in a super colony, you can have as many as 1,500 queens and therefore a huge genetic diversity, which means that these individuals should not normally cooperate. Obviously, we are now asking ourselves the reasons for this paradox in order to understand this stable social structure in this particular situation. And perhaps there's much more we can learn from them. Freedom of movement is a basic political right in the Swiss super colony. These are dyed-in-the-wool federalists. Arno Maeder shows us how. Now sporting bright new shirts representing the nests they came from, Arno returns the ants where he found them, in different parts of the forest. They're soon back to work, freely interacting with each other no matter where they come from in the colony. Forget the coloured shirts, that's for our information. It's the odour of the other that counts. They all carry the same chemical signature. They belong to the same super colony, even if they inhabit different nests. The ants go as they please, still baffling scientists with the complexity and efficiency of their federal super state. Has our political odyssey through the animal kingdom at last found the perfect society? Do these free Formica ants win your vote? Long before man first dabbled in politics, animals were steeped in the cruelty of slave labour, the sexual politics of the permissive society, Machiavellian self-interest and much more. So look into your own community and find perhaps mixed comfort in the wisdom of Aristotle. Man is by nature a political animal.